Two good pieces of news apropos of my sports sensitive guest, Stephen A. Smith. Uh, Aaron Judge of the Yankees just hit home run number 62. That means he is the man. He just passed Roger Maris. 62 home runs, no asterisk uh, for this guy. Also, I forgot to mention at the top of the show, have an easy fast to all my Jewish brothers and sisters as we begin Yom Kippur. All right, so there's our news. Now, I brought in Stephen A. Smith because he's a friend, and I need him to get inside this. There's a lot of fishy things surrounding the Dolphins yeah. and their controversial decision to keep quarterback Tua Tugovailoa. Tugovailoa. Take it. Tugovailoa. They kept him playing, and it seems like a bad move any yeah. way you look at it. Now we're learning about that and another story I want to get Stephen's take on, the systemic sexual abuse in women's soccer. Systemic means that it's been going on for a very long time, which means people knew about it. Why are we just learning about it? ESPN legend Stephen A. Smith, also the host of a new podcast called No Mercy, K-N-O-W. It's subtle. It's smart. I'm going to be on it, I think, tomorrow, yes. which was a great pleasure, and I wish you great success. Thank you. Thank you Thank so you. much. Thank you for being a guest on it. Oh, my I pleasure. It. So, Aaron Judge, no asterisk, right? Yes, right. No asterisk. Not at all. Nobody's ever, nobody's ever suspected anything about him. He deserves it. He deserves a lot of credit, even though I've always been a critic of those who say the asterisk needs to be attached to these other guys. Not to say that it did it, but you're the networks. You were collecting the money. You're the league. You were collecting the money. Then after you collect the money and the hype and all the hoopla that went along with it, then you want us to forget about the Barry Bonds, the Mark McGuire's, the Sammy Sosa's. I don't like that. If you wanted to accept it and take the money, then take everything that goes with it. Put him in a Hall of Fame. Just put an asterisk next to the name and call it a day. But as it pertains to Aaron Judge, this, that's not applicable here. And I will tell you this, I'm incredibly happy for him, but I am a diehard New York Yankees fan, which means that although I appreciate the fact that he has the record and he deserves to be celebrated, I want my World Series. They haven't been to the World Series since 2009. I need you to step up and win, all of them. See, that's the problem with you that's New right. York fans, though. That's You're really, never satisfied. Is that right, Mr. Jets? Is that really? Is just me? Jets have been bad my entire <laughs> life. I interviewed Joe Namath, and he said to me, we were good the year before you were born. Wow. And I was like, maybe I'm the problem. He said, maybe in. so. Rubbed it in. So yeah. I start doing a little homework on this. A friend of, my, a friend of mine, uh, Marty Jaramillo, does. Uh, he's a big-time PT, and he's now doing analysis of sports. Okay. He was watching the two of game live yes. yeah. and he said immediately what happened with his hand uh, is a sign yes. of a serious, serious. Uh, brain problem uh, and it's good for the doctors to see that because they'll know what they're dealing with yes then we start to dig they wrote this off as a back problem exactly initially exactly. and it looks like now like hey kid it's a back problem right it's just a back problem right mm -hmm. so he wasn't in the concussion protocol that's right so that's, that's how he got to play again exactly and that's the problem because the Sunday the, the Sunday before the Thursday night game, they had a game in Miami against the Buffalo Bills, and he got hurt in the second quarter. He leaves the game. He comes back out at half to after halftime of that game. When he went down, he got up, but he was clearly groggy and he, fell back groggy. down. I'm fell groggy. back down. I mean, he could that, barely I mean, walk. That, he could barely walk. And they tried to say it was a back injury, which was egregious in and of itself. None of us believe that. But then you've got a Thursday night game. Remember, usually when you go into concussion protocol, you've got to wait like five to six days before they reevaluate you and they allow you to, to play again, potentially seven days later. This is a short week. So you had a game four days later. So that's why, you know, you say the back injury, nobody believes that. They're sticking to their story. We don't have you know, obviously definitive evidence to the contrary, and we have to be responsible enough to say that. But it looks suspicious. I work at ESPN. I work with an abundance of former NFL players. They're on my show first take every weekday morning, and, the, and none of them believed that it was a back injury. All of them suspected otherwise. And so naturally when this happened to Tua after, in the, during the Cincinnati game and his fingers were the way that they were, I went on the air the next day and I called for somebody. I said, somebody's got to be fired. Yeah, and somebody then, dropped then the ball. Then they fired this guy that's called an UNC. UNC which is an unaffiliated a neurology consultant. That's what my That's right. buddy Marty Jaramillo explained to me. Yes. He's not even on the team. No. My problem with this is this, and you explained to me, Stephen, that you know the Players Association, they want a guy who's unaffiliated That's so right. that they get a fair read. Right. But they're in cahoots. These people know things. The team doctors got to know. Mm -hmm. Our managers have to yeah. know. Coaches have to know. Yes. Ownership has to know. This is your boy, yes. Tua. He's everything yeah. for you. The idea that only one guy is responsible? Well, being the political aficionado that you are, you'll relate very, very well to the statement I'm about to make. It's called plausible deniability. 
We've heard politicians use that on many, many occasions, dating back to the 80s, probably before that, definitely after. And in this particular case, it's definitely, it definitely appears to be applicable. The fact of the matter is, is that if you've had that guy that isn't associated necessarily with the team, you let him go, all of a sudden it provides cover for everybody else. Now, the Players Association isn't going for it. They're still investigating the matter. The National Football League is still investigating the matter. We'll see what we find out and what we discover in the days and the weeks to come. But consider Considering all the noise that has been made spanning decades now as it pertains to concussion in the sport of professional football, you best believe everybody's going to dot their I's and cross their T's because there's going to be tremendous ramifications if there's long-term damage to have been found with to a tongue of a lower. Make no mistake about it. New, uh, another rule from politics that may translate here. It's not the crime. It's the cover-up. Yes. They're going to find out that it wasn't a back injury. Yep. Uh, that they were examining him for a head injury. He wasn't in the protocol, but yep. they were looking at him. Why, if it was a back injury? They're going to find out people knew, and it's going to be a problem, and it needs to be, because we're never going to make this game mm -hmm. safer. Yep. I know they're doing helmet technology. You yep. talk to anybody who understands the brain, mm -hmm. they'll say, it's not how hard you get here. It's that the brain is sloshing around inside your head. Remember, That's always going to be the years game. Years ago when Michael Vick, got out of prison because of the whole dog fighting scandal mm -hmm. and he played it it was a couple of years later and i never forget it because i was in attendance at the game he got hit in the stomach went down and grabbed his head because the shot mm -hmm. of his head snapping i mean it discombobulated him and i never forgot that so i get exactly where you're coming from but in the end again they're gonna have to do something and this is the problem i think that miami dolphins has you've got a coach of mike mcdaniel's a first year coach he's doing a hell of a job and we don't want to accuse anybody of doing anything wrong intentionally but the doubling down we handled everything properly we did nothing wrong i completely co-signed with what you know what yeah. procedural issues we took that we followed no no, you can't, can't do that based on what we're yeah, seeing. Can't be. Can't and that's the only thing you can control because, again, exactly. you're not going to make the game less violent. That's why people watch. Exactly. That's the reality. We don't want to say it, but you know that's why you watch. Yeah. Now, a couple of quick takes. We don't know enough about what's emerging in this soccer uh, scandal involving women's soccer. But it keeps getting uh, deeper that, well, it's not just college. It's high school. It's not, it's not just in the uh, developmental ranks. Right. It's be before that. Systemic. Is this something that has been whispered about, talked about, but is, is now blowing up? It always has been. And the fact of the matter is that what we're discovering more and more each and every single day is that there are a plethora of issues involving women being victimized, sexual behavior, sexual misconduct, sexual assault, et cetera, et cetera. And we're hearing this every single year there's a new story and the cover-up doesn't span a few weeks or a few months it spans years think about what happened at michigan state think about what happened in various other places where you saw young females being mistreated young females being groped being touched being sexually assaulted we find out more and more and more about this so when i heard about this story again i don't cover soccer on a regular basis we still got to dig our teeth into what has transpired espn obviously broke the story but the bottom line is at the end of the day, it's, it did not surprise me at all when I heard about it because we've been hearing about these stories for far too young. And it's usually involving young ladies. Obviously, people are taking advantage of these young ladies at a very, very early age, and it carries on for years to come. Hopefully, because of what happened with gymnastics, yes. there'll be enough attention because you understand how much it can span. Uh, Sally Yates released right. a report following uh, Washington Post uh, and The Athletic detailing uh, this abuse at the pro level, but yes. then college, yes. high school, right. uh, there's a cascade effect. Uh, and if it's systemic, you got to root it out or it will never end. Now, Herschel Walker, here's my question for you about yeah. that. The intrigue about his positions, um, the intrigue about his son, mm -hmm. which I think uh, may well, we agree, may be uh, his yes. undoing politically. Definitely. Athletes as leaders, mm. they definitely get a head start. But as somebody who understands people who are great on the court and on the field, when does that translate? into other spheres of society? Number one, when you, sh when you attach community service 
to their expertise, to their exploits. It's one thing to be an athlete, but when you are somebody that prides yourself in attaching yourself with communities, particularly disenfranchised communities, people who are underserved, people who are at a distinct, at a distinct disadvantage, that resonates with the public. Number two, educating yourself about the issue. So when you open your mouth and you talk about it and you articulate and elocute your thoughts in a very intelligent fashion, a very informed fashion, and you're reluctant to speak otherwise, if you're not in the in other words, if you're not informed, you're reluctant to speak. When you conduct yourself in that responsible fashion, people take notice. The problem is a lot of times when you see athletes and they're gung-ho about stepping forward, a lot of people blame them, but it's not them. It's the community because the community, particularly as it pertains to the African-American athlete, because you have a vast majority of African-Americans who feel somewhat voiceless. And so when you have somebody with a microphone and a camera and the spotlight is on you, the people are saying, you got to address this. You got to tackle this issue. You got to bring attention to it. Trayvon Martin, for example, that was not a sports issue. That was not a sports issue. Yes, we saw the president, Barack Obama at the time, speak on it. But you saw Dwayne Wade and LeBron James and Chris Bosh and all of those guys put on That's hitties, the next level. Put on hitties, hoodies to bring attention right. to what transpired. Don't judge a book by its cover. Don't think that just because somebody's wearing a hood that you have a right to, you know, you know, characterize them. When your guys like LeBron James and others speak up, it resonates. But you still have a segment of the population that says, we just want to see you play. Mm. He's not going to do that. He's going to give a voice. But in the same breath, from an elected perspective, meaning running for elected office, that's an entirely different animal altogether. And that's what and he's that's learning what, right and now. And a lot of times it's, not, it's just not to their advantage to do so. I want to thank you for coming. And I want to give a nod to a moment I thought I would never see. Mm. Um, so Michael Irvin, Cowboys great. Stephen A. Smith, if you know his name, you know he does not like the Cowboys. No. You had the longest period of silence in your <laughs> broadcasting career when Michael Irvin went on this oh preacher-worthy oh rant about how the defensive front line of the Cowboys, five-finger-looking good. good, were bad. It was the quietest moment you've ever had. It was all over social media. It had to be destructive to your sense of self. Can you recover? It's easy to recover. Because as I tell people all the time when it comes to the Dallas Cowboys, just be patient. Just wait. Don't be, don't be, don't rush it. They will mess up. They will not let you down. Just, just be patient. They'll win a few games. They'll get everybody hyped. They'll make you think they're going to do something come postseason time. And right when you think they're going to get it done in your hype. They will fall like a bag of bricks. So you're this just is waiting. what they do. So All right. he, that's Michael Irvin. He's a Hall of Famer, three-time Super Bowl champion. Now he's a Hall of Fame cheerleader. We get all of that. He can do all of that stuff all he wants to. It will not help him. It will not help him. Stephen A. Smith, thank you. Good no luck mercy. with the podcast. Thank you, man. No Mercy, K-N-O-W. It's all about depth. Great conversations. Check it out.